compositeur finlandais. Air est un groupe de musique français originaire de Versailles formé en 1995 composé de Jean Benoît, Duncan et de Nicolas Gobin. Rika Virgin est une chanson de l'artiste américaine Madonna qui figure sur son deuxième album du...
Hirn und Hände wollen zusammenkommen. Aber es fehlt ihnen das Herz dazu. Mittler zwischen Hirn und Händen muss das Herz sein. Is it working now? No. Let's see. In the worst case, you can all hear me. So that's good. But let's see. Hey, Thomas. <laughs> Do I need to pair it? <laughs> now? Fantastic. I try now. Is it working now? Is it? Okay. Is it? It doesn't sound like it's working. Is it working? Now it's working. Okay. I don't have to shout, which is even better for my voice. Um, welcome to Futurists and to this third breakfast meeting. Uh, there were some faces I recognized from before. So welcome back and everybody else who hasn't been here. Welcome for the first time. So some very practical things before we get into the discussion. Please, of course, switch off your phones if you can, at least the, s the sound of it. Um, bathrooms are straight out here if you need to sneak out. If you do need to leave at some point, please try and find a moment where you can. Uh, we will stop you, of course. We're not going to let you out before we're done. Um, but. Um, from a practical point of view, we had an agenda here earlier, um, and it's going to come back up. But basically, we're going to have three talks today, three very short talks, followed by a panel discussion. And during the panel discussion is also where we're going to weave in your questions. The good thing is because we're in a kind of a intimate space here, we can actually do this, like make it feel more like a conversation than people up on stage. So please keep your questions until then. Uh, I would like to get through the talks pretty quickly and then when we get to the panel discussion then we have time for questions. I also know that often on those um, breakfast seminars people have to go to work, we know that. If you can, stay after the talks for the panel discussion. It's just as much an important part. But of course if you do need to leave, that's fine. We won't stop you just then. Um, but it would be great to get all your thoughts and input as well. So my name is Sonja Lackner. I'm the strategy director here at Futurist in Stockholm. And I will be your host today and I'm also going to be asking the questions in the, in the panel. Um, the practical things I actually had already, which is great. So some of you might not know that much about Futurist. So Futurist has been around in Stockholm for around three years. But we have been, we're originally a Finnish company where we have been around for much, much longer. 
And uh, I would say what we call ourselves, it's kind of changing because the market changes, the, you know, the, the competences changes, but we call ourselves a digital engineering, uh, no, sorry, an innovation engineering agency. Um, and we help our clients with their innovation agendas. So that means we come in at a lot of different phases of that innovation agenda, and we help them to find problems to solve. Now, you might think, okay, everybody has problems to solve, but we try and look at what are the right problems to solve, not just what the problems are that the client thinks they have to solve. And then I think what's, uh, what's the difference from us with a lot of other agencies and consultancies is that we also then can build the solutions. We can design and build the products and services that um, are the best fit in that sense. Um, and again, we're also there, we're kind of trying to get from the idea to a solution pretty quickly. Because that is something that we have identified that a lot of people are very frustrated with. They have the ideas, they have the will to do things, but then it takes forever to get something done. And I think also today you'll hear a lot about that, like how we really want to get from just talking about sustainability, for example, to actually doing something and actually doing something quickly. You can then still iterate and work on it. You don't have to tackle everything at once, but it's something that you can... The most important thing is to get started. So... Um, also today we will get started pretty quickly. Um, but I just wanted to say as well, we're going to talk about sustainability and circular economies in particular today. And also we're going to talk about collaboration, um, which is something that is... I'm very happy that you're all here because I'm happy that you also want this planet to survive and human species to survive. I cannot guarantee you that we are the ones that are going to survive, but at least we're here, at least we're trying which is great. Um, we at Futurists don't call ourselves a sustainability agency. There are agencies that do that and they call themselves sustainability agencies that are experts. I think for us, we have experts as well, but generally we're trying to make sustainability part of our organization, part of how we work with projects, but also just helping clients putting it on their agenda. I think those are the things that we just try to do when we work on all kinds of different projects. And we also have discovered that the way we work and the way our uh, methodology works, it's actually perfect for this kind of project where you need a lot of collaboration and a lot of iteration. So what we've tried to do is really, we've started to think about where in the process and in the methodology we can actually weave in the discussions about sustainability in a better way. So we've started to add, we, have, we work a lot with canvases, we've ar started to add canvases around societal impact, economical, Im environmental impact, um, but also, for example, we, we've had a talk before about ethics in AI, like all kinds of different um, topics. Diversity and inclusion is something that we're very passionate about. And I think that's just our way of starting to get that discussion started, but also just to make sure that something happens and it doesn't just stay at the talking. So this is also what we're going to do now. I'm not going to talk anymore. Yes, we are going to talk, but we're going to talk about things that have actually been done. So that's good. We have three excellent speakers here today. I'm trying to look where you are. Here we have Sandra who's going to start. And then uh, we have Magnus over here and Sabina here. So we're gonna do, and I'm gonna introduce them more, um, uh, uh, more in more in detail. But what we're gonna do today is we're gonna actually look at first. We're gonna look a little bit about on the at the um, uh, sustainable development goals. And Sandra has a lot of insight about that. And also just we're gonna go a little bit then into how an organization, how a company works with them. And then we're going to go into very concrete projects. So we're really going to try and go very concrete pretty quickly. So I would like to welcome up on stage first Sandra Rundstern, who's Sustainable Business Designer at the New Division. Thank you very much.
thank you, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, as uh, Sonia said, I will go through a little bit um, high level what is sustainability, why is it important to have a common language on what we are going to achieve uh, by 2030, and we are right. Why? <laughs> Very short speech. <laughs> Right, so I am from the new division. Uh, we work with sustainability, uh, with communication, with design, and with strategy, and I work with business strategy there. Um, they are all uh, linked together, and this uh, agency was founded because our founder, Jakob Trollbeck, in New York, uh, was a co-creator of uh, the United Nations Global Goals, um, specifically the design and the language uh, of them. They were created in 2015, as I think you know, um, and it started off something like this, with a little sketches, um, and this can be a talk in itself, how difficult it is to have 192 nations come together on what colors to use and what symbols to use. Um, but it was agreed on, and here they are, the 17 global goals that is a sort of the business plan or the roadmap to 2030 on how can we save the planet and make it livable, as I think you all know. So they can be divided into three um, layers, basically, um, or three bottom lines, um, where we have uh, economic uh, sustainability, societal, and um, environmental. And they also have sub-targets on what we are going to achieve under each goal, so that we just don't pin a certain goal to our business strategy and think that we are helping help the world gets, get better just because of that. So these are all uh, interconnected. Some of them enhance each other positively. Some of them, uh, for example, economic growth, uh, in many, many cases have a um, negative impact on climate action, for example. So it is a very complex thing turned very, very easy to use and understand, but it is still complex, and it needs to be. Um, but I think it is of utmost um, importance to have these very understandable and easy to use goals and targets. This is uh, target nine, uh, universal access to information and communications technology. This is something that is worked with here and at Telia. And uh, this is from tar uh, goal 12, target 12.8, promote universal understanding of sustainable lifestyles, which is something we will go into deeper today. And uh, so this is a language that is used throughout the world by organizations, by nations, uh, and by companies. And I think it shall be. I think it is very, very important, especially for companies to use it. We, a lot of us spend our most creative uh, and best hours at companies. Uh, they are the ones producing uh, a lot of the things we are consuming. Um, they are uh, the reason uh, behind most of the environmental footprints that are being um, created today and can therefore, and needs therefore to be the solution, I believe. Um, so there is a roadmap with um, goals on where we are going to be uh, by 2015, by 2025, by 2030. And so how is this relevant for sustainability? And how is sustainability changing and maturing? It started off, when I started off working with sustainability, uh, I was a CSR manager. Uh, and that is basically doing good um, outside of your core business. You might help an orphanage, you might help your society, you might donate money or time 
to do a specific project. That is bettering and that is very good, but it's not changing the impact you have and the impact your services or goods have on society. Um, so we see a shift towards it being an in integrated part of business, uh, which I think is very important and which is what Futurist has been doing with Telia. This is where real change can happen. CSR is and will still be an important part, especially in those parts of the world where we don't have a welfare system, for example. There it might be very, very important to also support your civil society. But that's not going to help us achieve uh, the global goals. So, as I said, the field of sustainability is maturing. We just did a survey. Um, we asked all of the sustainability reporting companies in Sweden uh, how they feel like they are based here on these uh, stairs where number one is uh, we do what's legally required from us. We do a minimum uh, of sustainability work and where seven is sustainability is our core. It is our business idea and it is um, in everything we do. And 2015, Swedish companies averaged on 408 here, being somewhat in the middle. They have sustainability in um, specific parts um, of their company or it is an integrated part of the um, uh, all processes, somewhere between there. Uh, more towards uh, separate parts of activities, I would say. By 2018, they were up uh, at 4.67, which is, which is a big shift, but it's not leaving number four. And they are estimating that by 2023, they will be up at 5.93. They have left almost where a sustainability is an integrated part of what they do, and they are pivoting towards sustainability at their core being equivalent or uh, more important than economic growth. I think these changes are, like this is a very, very steep change to make. Uh, I think they are correct in estimated that this will be steep for them. Uh, and I think they might have to do more by 2023, but it is, this requires a lot of work. This requires to actually do sustainability. Um, uh, yeah, so all Swedish companies that are by law required to um, have a sustainability report. Uh, no, uh, they need to be, they need to have more than, is it 250 employees? Uh, yeah, exactly, and they need to have a turnover of, they need to be of pretty big size. I'll, let's, let's Google up the exact details. Um, but, um, but to be required by law, you have to be of a certain size, and many do it voluntarily. Uh, but the ones who have asked, uh, who have answered, um, they are they are above above that size. Come again? Do you want to use it? Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Um, so, is there the, a legal framework around this as well when companies have to report on sustainability? I guess. Um, in these things, does that also entail uh, responsibility for actions which are considered sustainable or not? Like how stringent are those things? They are just obliged to report what they are doing. I don't think they are obliged to achieve certain results. Unfortunately, uh, we might see a shift in that. I mean, some uh, industries are obviously regulated on what they can and cannot do sustainability-wise, but not under um, the reporting law. So, uh, Forbes, uh, their trend analysis is that responsible consumerism will go mainstream in 2019. I don't think that has happened yet, not even in Sweden, uh, which is at the top 
uh, at the frontier of sustainability trends. Uh, but 2019 is not over, and we have seen big shifts in uh, public opinion and what pressure uh, customers put on companies. Here is from Sustainability Brand Index. We see that 73% of Swedes are discussing sustainability with friends uh, and family. And 65% are optimists, believe we can solve the climate crisis. Let's hope we can. 37% um, are willing to pay 10% or more to have a sustainable good. And 74% of Swedish customers say that sustainability impacts their buying decisions. And this is an ever-increasing figure. This is changing. I mean, I guess you've all noticed how quickly um, flight shame has caught on uh, and how s rapid that sh shift in uh, the public mind was. I think that is going to happen more and more quickly, which makes it even more important for su sustainability to be a strategic issue within the companies. Because when things change, they, th they change quickly. Companies are changing, stakeholders are changing, laws and regulations are changing, you are changing, I think. I am. This is a change we want to be and want to see. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. So now up on stage, please welcome with me, we have uh, Magnus Lindvall, who's a sustainability accelerator at yes. Telia. So welcome up, Magnus. Thanks. Do I need the microphone at all? Or can you hear me in the back? <laughs> you can? Do I need it? Yeah, for, the for the live, yeah. for the live stream. Okay, for the live. What don't you do for the live streams? Hi, everyone. Magnus Lindvall from Telia. Um, I have some voice problems myself. It's a hay fever, partly, and then I'm a bit nervous, so that kind of interacts. So be with me here, and we're gonna have a good 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I have a quite cool title, I thought, Sustainability Accelerator. Um, in my age, you know, that's, that's something to have some title like that. But it's actually encompasses, it's not about being cool at all, it encompasses that sustainability needs to be ac accelerated and we need to have sustainability and business all together. And I will come into that in, in a second um, in my presentation. And then I'm pressing here and see what happens. There you go. So I'm from Telia Company. Who knows Telia Company? Who, who doesn't know Telia Company at all or Telia? Hand up. One person. Good. Then we've made a brand, brand image then. Okay, um, just shortly, Telia Company is the leading telecom operator in Sweden and the Nordics and the Baltics, I would say. A bit different in the different countries, but in total. We've been around for quite some time, I'll come back to that. Um, we're not just doing telephony, obviously, we're doing a lot of things in terms of communication services and ICT and contact centers and Internet of Things and all sorts of different services around that. Most people would know us from, you know, mobile telephony or fixed telephony or even, uh, you know, fax machines back in the days that were operated by networks from Telia. So I will be talking a bit about our new daring goals for sustainability that were presented just in, in March recently. What's that all about? And then I think I will touch a bit upon going from ego systems to ecosystems, whatever that can mean. And then something about moving from campaigns when it comes to sustainability to actually have sustainability as part of your core. And we pride ourselves a bit and say that, well, I tell you, we've been working with sustainability for 170 years almost. How can that be? Well, I would say it's two things the elevator pitch things when it comes to st sustainability in a company like Telia. One is that we actually build networks, right? Mobile networks, fixed networks and fibers, connectivity that everyone can use. So it's like cars moving, running on roads. You don't have your own road, right? You share the road. Or, or commuting traffic. You share the subway and the buses. That's the same with the, with the mobile networks and the fixed networks. It's something that we share. So the, it's a sharing economy from the start. And secondly, 
is about us helping and enabling people and businesses and organizations to actually share information rather than to you know travel around physically so sharing information and enabling others to do stuff they couldn't do without our services i would say is also sustainable i'll come back to a few examples on that as well so the business as such is sustainable and i'm really lucky we're not in the oil business or some other kind of business where the kind of core of the business is actually very unsustainable then on the other hand you have a lot of work to, to be done to disrupt your business obviously Yeah, and so this is what we're facing, right? This is the ambition that the country of Sweden has up until 2045 on emissions. Zero. 2045. 70% cut up until 2030. And what happens if we don't make it? We don't really want to think about But this is like the one material question of our time. <laughs> so it's a great time to be alive, right? because we're the ones who are going to make it. And, and sometimes you need to call for that urgency. And sometimes when you look at this framework that Sandra uh, introduced us recently and you, most of you know of, I would actually see it as not so much as a roadmap. Well, it's a roadmap. But I would actually see it as a first aid kit for humanity because that's what it is. It's our first aid kit. You know, The solutions are in here or the tools are in here, but you need to apply them in the right way. So this obviously, take, obviously takes care of not only uh, environmental issues, but also social issues and how people are actually going to thrive good lives all over the world. Um, but the, um, the climate issue is the one that has kind of really a, a time limit attached to it, right? Yeah. Um, back to the Swedish government again. <laughs> I mean, I'm in the digitalization business, and quite a few of you guys are. You work with digital tools and digital services, right? So you need connectivity for that. So you used to have a home page if you don't have internet. And then the Swedish government says, not only that we're going to be climate neutral or have zero emissions by 2045, but also that Sweden is supposed to be leading in digitalization in the world and to utilize on the opportunities of digitalization. That's a bold statement. We're very far ahead, obviously, but we are we are the world leaders, we say. So that's you know that's a high um, stake to claim. And if you look at what this guy says, Johan Rockström, he's a Swedish bloke. He's heading up the Environmental in Research Institute in in Potsdam at at the moment. Um, he's a climate researcher. He's somewhat of the of the messy of the climate <laughs> of the climate world perhaps v well known and very skilled um, and then there was this report uh, last year in the fall by IPCC that stated different lines of business where are they how are they gonna go about to reach you know the zero emissions and then there's transportation and there's real estate and there's seven or six different businesses, I think, that's outlined in the report. And then he says, well, to achieve this, then we need digitalization. We need to you know, connect people and businesses, and we need to do things in new ways. So digitalization, he says, is the joker of uh, the world economy and has solutions to enable others to actually cut their emissions or half the emissions, which, which is the goal up until, up until 2030. So that's something that we, that we take with us. And knowing that we need to move right from a linear to a circular economy, we need to do things in a different way and we need to use resources differently and we need to stop wasting things, <laughs> not only things, physical things, but also time and our travel and all that. That's a bit depressing. You know that this, as an average Swede has an emission of around 10 tons a year. A lot of that is consumption you know, from production uh, overseas. And we need to go down to what, one, one two tons or something. So we need to cut drastically, right? And how can we do that without lo losing momentum and not killing our economies? Because that's not what we want. And so we thought about that, Atelia, <coughs> for quite some. And we had our environmental and climate targets already. Well, not climate targets. We had environmental targets. And these are the one that were ones that were presented to the investors and to the communities um, end of March. At the from our CEO at the same time as the annual report was presented. And 
having had targets that were typically like increasing energy efficiency by 5% annually or um, having ISO certification on all markets, these kind of targets that none of the employees understood anything about or could do anything about really, or very few of them, <laughs> not none, but not the average employee, not the average employee about among 14,000 people at Telia company would have so much to do with you know ISO 14001 certifications or energy efficiency measures. So we didn't really get you know the enthusiasm around people with that. So we decided we need to have something out, something out there. We need to have something that actually calls for action and that actually can gather the whole company and that also actually can make things happen for real. So we decided that if we're going to have bold targets or daring targets, we can't really say, well, we're going to have some emissions. Not so much, but some. Or we're going to have quite a few waste. Not so much, but we're still going to have a lot of waste. So we said, no, we need to aim for zero. And the, the daring thing with it is not about the company and our employees. This is about our value chain. So it means our suppliers are part of this and our customers are part of it. Because we're changing other businesses, right? Digitalization is the key for other businesses to have their emissions. So then we need to start measure how that actually happens with our customers. And then that's what, what our impact is all about, rather than us perhaps stopping having paper cups in our offices or you know, stuff like that, which is also important, but it's not going to be a dramatic change in emissions cutting from that. And that's typically where you would start. If you ask a hundred random people, what should we start doing? They say, stop paper cups. Um, don't fly so much. You know, work from home one day a week. Yeah, these are all good things, but they're not going to disrupt, you know, enough to reach the Agenda 2030. So we said zero CO2 to and zero waste and 100% action meaning that all of our 14,000 people are a part of this. It's not the sustainability guy down the corner, this uh, accelerator type with you know, the guy who says he has a cool title. He's not the one who's going to do it. They're not going to do it. It's us. It's everyone. And everyone can be part of this and that's the, the whole idea. So we're rolling it out no, now to, to all the people and that's what the acceleration is, is a bit about, to actually make sure that we have all our people on board and that they understand what this is about and how they can act. And the thing is, frankly, honestly, in, in this room, we don't know exactly how we're going to do this up until 2030. Who has a plan up until 2030 in detail? No one. So what we're doing now is that we are aligning our organization or we're actually doing a lot of work now to start making sure that we have actions going on so we can start claiming that we can show proof of wh where we're heading and that is what the investors are going to ask us about they already are okay so next quarter they say show us the proof points then what have you achieved because we're going to measure your company whether it's investable or not by how you reached you know towards the brave goals that you have been presenting so then we start actually get our investors on board and other people to try to get you know measures from us that they can actually evaluate. And then we say, well, these three of the 70s are the one, 17 are the one that we are, ones that we will be kind of focusing on, on this, 9, 11, and 12, because we think that that's where the digitalization and the connectivity and the internet capacity and the internet of things will have the most impact in innovation and in smart societies and in, in altering the consumption patterns. We're running out of time? No, five, wow. <laughs> five minutes, it's an ocean of time. Um, and so we decided to, to ha so how should we talk with our 30,000 suppliers about this then? And among those are multinational companies with, you know, headed by Chinese or Americans or Koreans. And here comes the little Swedish company with 14,000 employees and say, well, we are going to be climate neutral soon. And you need to be part of that. Yeah, they say, but we have business to take care of. So what we did was that we formulated a letter that was sent out from our CEO and from, my, from our purchasing director. The same day as we had this presentation of the new goals, we sent out this letter and saying that from now on, or from very soon on, by the end of this year, we will have emissions as one selection criteria for you as a supplier. And so we would want you to come back to us or to talk to us about how your plan 
towards being climate neutral in 2030 is going to look like because that's something that we're going to you know evaluate our suppliers on because that's the targets that we have and that's actually the targets that we have promised our investors and our employees to reach we don't exactly know how but we need you to help us um, and to some that's you know no problem yeah sure and for others this is totally disruptive and they need to talk to their top managers in some foreign countries far away and have never heard of any company coming to them with these kind of you know demands all of a sudden so th this is a super super interesting thing that's happening now that I, I feel super proud of actually that we are driving I feel that anyway that we are kind of driving a whole business kind of towards something by being a bit daring and, and and also being very transparent saying we don't exactly know how this is gonna happen but it needs to happen um, and obviously I mean, apart from suppliers super important that's a very big part of the footprint and you know our our, our, our business is depending on suppliers but then we have different partners and, and customers ob obviously and this is a team sport right so we need to be good at collaboration and innovation we can just you know continue selling mobile services like we did 10 years ago or just as little as we just can could continue selling fax machines you know when no one used fax machines anymore so we need to change our business obviously all the time and we can't do that ourselves so we need to in innovate and integrate with others so we're in the healthcare sector, trying to enable you know, distance care services for elderly people, for instance, um, which is typically regulated. So it's not very hard, very easy to do because you know the data, the personal data, uh, health data is very, very carefully regulated. So that there's kind of barriers for that, but that's something that really takes off uh, in different areas. We're working with with mining, with the mining industry to enable, s um, you know, um, and mining these uh, trans these. Uh, huge machines that are used in mines to you know, excavate creates a lot of dust and a lot of uh, all sorts of things that's not very fun for, for a human being to be part of so we couldn't we try to connect now or we are connecting with Volvo for instance and Bo Liden who runs the mines up north connecting the vehicles in the mines from a distance with with the new 5g technology that we invest billions of Swedish crowns into now the next generation mobile networks that will actually enable you know, self-driving cars on the roads or um, drones delivering heart starting equipment to someone who actually is far away and needs a heart starter uh, in, a, in a very, you know, now. So that we do with Ericsson, for instance. Um, cool things like that, that actually can change and have better lives for people. That is something that we do with others. We can't do it ourselves. Or smart public transportation, making sure that we understand what routes are actually good to take for the buses. Where are people? We know that from the mobile networks, right? So we can use that information to help the public transportation companies to enable smarter services, or to have Wi-Fi on board, or to have alarm systems for, for the drivers, you know, if something happens, and to enable echo driving and get instant re real-time feedback on how you're performing, stuff like that. And then there is some others that are good at collaboration too, or starting, this is, this is a workshop two weeks ago in Solna Stad, which is just the next door city here in Stockholm that have a lot of traffic going through it. It's the smallest municipality or commune in Swedish, I think, in the country, but it has a lot of traffic and a lot of emissions in its borders, so to say. And so they said, this is the, the mayor of Solna Stad, uh, in they invited all the companies in Solna for a workshop for, um, for an afternoon on climate and said, well, these are our targets. This is the Stockholm region and the emission targets, or the emission curve that needs to take place for us to be able to deliver on, you know, the national goals, zero emissions by 2045, 70 cut by 2030. And look at this, look at this chart. So this is 2018, this is 2019. So this is the peak year. And now it's downhill, rapidly. And how is Solna municipality going to solve that? Well, not by themselves. So they invited us to, to discuss. So we sat in little groups, you know, different companies discussing how can we help, you know, this municipality doing this. So it's a really interesting discussions taking place and also com competitive companies, you know, around the same table. 
And that's a super good example, I thought, of how others also see these you know, challenges taking place and that open up for, we, we, no, we don't know exactly how to do it, but we're gonna collaborate on it. So I thought, thought that's one of, one of many good examples that things are happening. And for us, obviously, it's super important talking about digitalization, this is my last slide, is that we need to have everyone on board, right? When you digitalize the society, you need to have people on board. Otherwise, you will have people who cannot, you know, uh, pay their tax in a good way or couldn't even travel with the public transport because you need a mobile phone for that. Or you couldn't, um, when, you know, the fixed telephony networks are being closed down in parts of the country, you need to be mobile or you need to be able to use the internet to connect with your grandchildren, etc. And if you look at it, it's interesting. This is from, you know, the latest report on the status of connectivity in Sweden that's released every year. And you see that 100% of everyone up until 25, between 16 and 25, used the internet. 100% or 100% claim they do. Anyway, there's perhaps one or two that don't. But then there is, I don't know whether this is a good or bad figure, but 26% of the under one-year-olds are connected. <laughs> Oof. But that's probably YouTube and, and you know, SVT Play or something, but still. Sorry? Yeah, they, they asked themselves, yeah, <laughs> sure. How would they answer themselves? Uh, no, it was probably their parents. Um, and then there's the, you know, 93% use internet at work. For but then there's half a million people, and that's my last kind of point, half a million people that are not connected at all. And there's one million if you also include the people that are rarely connected or more, more, more seldom than once a week. So there is a digital divide here that we need to kind of work on. We have a lot of cool initiatives on that where we help uh, the municipalities setting up uh, teaching elderly about the internet with kids from the municipality. It's called Mia Digital or Go Digital that have won several prizes. But this is super important. So we need to digitalize in a sustainable way and get everyone on board. It's also a matter of democracy and, and, and fairness. Yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Magnus. So how is it temperature-wise in here? It feels a bit warm. Is it warm there with the window? Maybe we should open another window there in the back or something. I can feel a little bit by looking at you. It's kind of going down. <laughs> but Sabina's going to wake you up. <laughs> so please welcome up on stage Sabina Poppin, who's a uh, senior service designer here at Futurist. And she's going to tell us about something that we've done together with Telia. Thank you. Hello. So thanks, Sonia, for the, for the short intro. It saves me some time. Um, so as Sonia said, I am a service designer. I'm also a strategic designer and, and what I like to call a systems thinker. But at the end of the day, that really doesn't matter because what I really do is I help people understand the state of today and help them collaborate towards a better tomorrow. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, I'm also going to touch a little bit on what does it actually mean to build a resilient future for large organizations um, and then what does it look like for us having worked with Telia over the last six months. So my team and I have been working quite in depth with Telia on circular economy um, for the last six months and so we're going to talk a little bit about you know the process of that, the challenges and learnings about that and, and what it looks like to actually go from a big strategy kind of piece all the way through to implementation. So firstly, how do we build a resilient future? What does that even mean, right? So I think resilience, um, purely the definition of it is really just to, to bounce back, to be able to kind of come back from challenges that we face, any shocks that we face. And I like to talk about resilience rather than sustainability because ultimately um, we don't know what a, a proper sustainable future really looks like. So resilience really allows us to actually move forward and explore things in ways that allow us to kind of be flexible going forward. Um, and what the things that we feel um, companies really need in order to actually reach a resilient future is to be able to design for iteration and change. Um, so the designers in the room will, will understand iteration really well. Um, also the, the tech people that work with agile development and, and, and lean process startups and, and things like that. You know, 
iteration makes sense for us. We're constantly doing it. But for a lot of large organizations, there's legacy systems and processes that don't allow that to happen. So we need to be able to move towards a more iterative um, process that allows us to kind of change over time. So that means any internal things that we're designing, any external processes that face our customers as well, products and services, to actually be able to kind of design them for change. So to take in feedback and to keep moving forward. So for that, we need flexibility and a willingness to sort of learn and pivot along the way. So for us as humans, uncertainty is inherently uncomfortable. Um, but wise words um, of people wiser than myself have said that, you know, the only constant really is change. So even in large organizations where it feels like things move slow and things are kind of consistent, actually things are changing all the time. So markets are changing all the time, economies are changing all the time. And so if we can kind of take that mindset through and actually just start to be comfortable with the process a little bit, so start to just trust the process of change, we can kind of move towards that a bit. Um, I'm just going to take one pause for a second, grab my water. Because mm, as these talks go, um, and I'm a human, my mouth gets really dry. <laughs> squeeze me. Um, all right, so in order to work towards that, we need to have a lot of transparency and a willingness to sort of share that work in progress. So not be waiting till the complete end thing, but actually be starting to share things as we go along. So for example, if we're working on you know, a product and a service, sharing that with our customers as we go along, giving them a chance to kind of give feedback before we've invested millions and bef before we've rolled out the thing completely. So I think, you know, that all sounds really esoteric and so will these a little bit, but I will get a bit more practical as we go through the example of the project that we worked on. I feel that in order to actually get there, we need to start co-designing with people. So for some of us in the room, this may feel really familiar, we do it all the time, but for others, this is a really new process. People who sit in these large organizations often don't get the chance to actually go and sit with customers, nor do they get the chance to even sit with the frontline staff at, that are the, at the front lines of that product or service that the company delivers. So we need to be able to go out and design with the people that are impacted by the things that we design. That requires collaboration across units. Um, and whether that starts really small, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're designing a really incremental thing. Um, it might be just a small internal process. Actually collaborating across units to get that diversity of opinions and diversity of, of experiences and knowledge um, to make sure that we're actually coming to solutions that, that really are hitting home in the right way. And then commitment and alignment across the organization. You know, um, Sandra really touched on this commitment and alignment on a really broader scale and having these, these tools and this language of the, the sustainable development goals that kind of allows us to sort of rally behind it and say, you know, I, I myself worked on my thesis, which was in collaborative consumption and production around, um, gosh, I'm showing my age. It was 2013, like how long ago was that? Um, and I didn't have a common language for that, you know, it was sort of like there were these great reports that the UN was, re UN was releasing, but there was no real way to say, oh yeah, I'm working on goal number 12, yep, that's me, right? Whereas now we have that, and I think the closer we can get to that in organizations, to Magnus's point with, with Telia's new goals as well, that really gives us a really clear thing to kind of work towards. So no matter which small piece of the pie we're working on it within an organization, we can say, yes, I'm building towards that and this is how the thing I'm working on is relevant for that thing. I will get more practical in a second. So we've been working with Telia for the last seven months on quite a broad business challenge. So it's looking at what does circular economy actually look like for Telia. Um, so looking at kind of how do we sort of create some solutions that are reducing impact on the environment, increasing value for customers, but also offering the business to, to explore new revenue opportunities, right, to stay relevant in their markets and in the current economic context that they work within. I have to say here, um, I'll pull the James Bond card. I can't actually tell you the details of the outcomes of the mission, but I can tell you about the process we've gone on, which really is the more important thing. So the collaboration that we've had and the partnership that we've had over the last six months is really the more important thing here. So let's get into it. Why does circular economy actually make sense for Telia? So I think Magnus brought it home really well, and these goals came out recently, but even before they came out, um, Telia had some really great targets that we were able to sort of follow um, from the very beginning. And these really helped us see that there was, you know, appetite and there was sort of a, a desire and an environment that was, that was willing to work with this. The tough challenge was that it wasn't in everybody's business um, 
goals. It wasn't in everybody's sort of business targets at the time. So not each unit had this as a, as a, as a complete goal. But it did give us a chance to say, look, this is coming from your organization. This is not something we're telling you to do. You want to do this. You want to be sustainable. You want to have um, a resilient future for your company. And so it help us, helped us to rally the troops along the way. And dare I say, Magnus was involved quite early on as well, which also helped us to kind of say, look, you know, your head of sustainability, as the title was then, um, is, is behind this. You know, you, this is something that is really important for your entire organization. Um, so that really helped us go forward. Now we can see actually circular economy is one of the core ones. So that's actually, you know, as we go through, we're starting to see changes happening all the time. So that makes the project even more relevant. Circular business models for a telco are kind of hard to talk about, and Ad Magnus mentioned this earlier, you know, you're sort of at the mercy of suppliers um, at the front end, you're sort of at the mercy of your customers at, at the other end of where their products and, and things end up. So what opportunities do we have inside? And I, and I think it's really important to kind of look at it as you don't have to do one bit by bit, you know, you can kind of work at all of the things simultaneously. You can start to work on different projects at different times, and for telcos, for example, you know, you can be starting with, you know, diverting from landfill, so resource recovery, you can start to extend the life of products, but you can also start to actually explore different services for customers to really challenge the way that they consume products. So our process, hands up designers in the room. Energy, oh my God, a room full of designers. Okay, so this, this looks familiar to you guys. You know, you know what this means, but for those of you that don't, it really it's your classic diverge and converge process. So we go really wide to explore as many options as we can, and then we start to define in more detail. The diamonds get smaller as we head towards implementation in our case. So we, as I said, we started really, really broad. We really had no idea where we would end up at the end of this. And honestly, we didn't e even know we would kind of keep going. We sort of had each phase of the project was um, almost an end in and of itself, but we kept going, we kept pushing. Um, and I think the thing I really wanted to point out here, because it is a familiar process for everyone, is it changed. The process completely changed. So we actually started off having you know, defined stages. We were like, yes, we're gonna design and build in the second phase, go us. That didn't happen. You know, the realities of organizations as we head towards implementation is you start to see how many different units, how many different people need to be involved all the way through to implementation. So even though you might start off with this great vision and this great journey that we can all go on and that's, you know, very aligned to the kind of the core business values, you still, once you get to implementation, you start to see that it, you know you have to kind of, the reality is really hard for most people and, and you need to kind of gather the funding to actually get through to that. So it did change for us. We pivoted at every single phase. Um, it's been, you know, I think it's quite a, a marathon that we've been running. Um, so a little bit in pictures, six rounds of, of co-design with customers and frontline staff. So this is bringing back that story of, you know, we really need to get in front of the people that are impacted by the products and services we design. Collaboration, of course, across business units, making sure that we really, really understand that current state, what is going on within that organization, and then together designing that future, making sure that the future is aligned to kind of what is actually possible for these people to design now and, and heading towards to the future. Prototype, learn and iterate and repeat. So each phase of our project, we were continually doing this. So we were continually going out there testing with customers, continually engaging with stakeholders and continually iterating on, on, the, on the processes. Again, at each point, really not knowing where we would finally end up. And I think one of the things that with um, a lot of design-led projects is that we, we often miss this bit. This is the kind of project within the project. This is the bit where, you know, we're doing our work and we're doing that sort of process on the ground, doing the things that we as service designers or UX designers um, or strategic designers are kind of at the core of our being. But then there's this stuff. There's the engagement across the entire organization. You know, there's, there's those, you know, sort of soft skills that kind of almost get overlooked. But this was actually, I would say, the kind of the biggest innovation on the project. It was the, it was the bit that helped us to gain the biggest tra traction with stakeholders. You know, we had a really small team to begin with that wasn't even continuous through the entire journey. So we really had to almost be tailier ourselves. We had to be in there 
um, sending out newsletters, doing showcases on a regular basis to really start to kind of gather the troops, if you will. So in numbers, just to hit it home a little bit, six months. Um, over six months, we had 31 stakeholders directly involved. Now, for a company of 14,000, that doesn't seem like a lot. But these 31 stakeholders were not direct project contacts, right? So they were people that along the way throughout the showcases became advocates for the work. So they really started to you know, give us data. They started to connect us to different people that they thought would help us go towards implementation. Um, they were people that would send us contacts to other people that might be interested in the project. They made time for us to actually you know, go out of their way to show us different data that would be relevant for the work. And they were from all across the business as well, so not even in the unit that we were directly working with. Um, so across that time, we did nine workshops and showcases. We sent out 10 newsletters. And I think the key here is 50 newsletter subscribers are both bo across both Telia and Hailbop. Again, it doesn't seem like a lot, but this project was built from the ground up. So to actually have these 31 stakeholders send people in their place, to actually send out these newsletters to, to people who would be interested, you're starting to get traction for this work, you know? And the, the further you go on with this kind of thing, the more traction you can actually gain. So it grew. It really grew exponentially. It grew beyond what we thought it would be. Again, we had no idea that Magnus would even be involved when we first started. Um, so it, it really grew to having this kind of strategic circular economy vision that really had a potential company-wide. You know, we had these really great nine concepts that were sort of almost ready. You know, they had a roadmap ready to be sort of implemented and fleshed out. And then, boom, 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 it shrank. So we went from nine concepts to one trial. So we've, we're now actually only at the, the kind of precipice of implementation of just that one small trial. But look, we don't see it as a failure. I think this, this story is the, the one that we don't often talk about as designers nor in companies. We always, always talk about the big success stories. Look, we made this amazing thing that won this amazing award. We don't talk about the reality of the situation. Implementation is difficult. It is a hard slog and it's really, really hard to get through it. And as designers where, you know, often, especially agency side, we're coming in for a month, two months, three months, going in and actually spending the six months. I have one designer in the room I know has spent two years in, a, in an organization. It is difficult work, you know, and you never know where you're really going to end up with it. So our key learnings. I think some of these are definitely things we know we did well. You know, we're like, this, this works. We're going to do this again. And some things we know we, we absolutely could do better. And I think this is reflective of, of us as an agency as well, of really having to learn these things along the way and change our process as well. So the first one there, we had a multidisciplinary team um, really on, so really early on. So for us, this was, you know, we had strategy that was involved quite early. We had um, tech and, and development involved quite early. And this really helped ground things in reality to make sure that us as designers weren't kind of recommending things that made absolutely no sense for anybody. So this was really important both from our side and from Talia's side. Humans at the center of what we do. Now I know as a sustainability conversation, um, we need to go further than that, right? But for a lot of organizations, even starting with the customer is quite a difficult thing. So I think that's one thing that we can all rally behind to gain empathy and to start to say, okay, well, customers are wanting this. Customers are saying these. These are their needs. And not just customers, but our frontline staff as well and all of the staff that are involved in getting things off the ground. Thirdly, visually engaging material. I really can't emphasize this one enough, and I think the, the goals kind of really speak to that is to, uh, to be able to kind of spread the word with so many different types of people, we need visual thinking. We need to be able to show this material in so many different ways so people can engage with it from different perspectives and to help them kind of come on the journey with us. Newsletters and showcases, I really I mentioned this one before, but the business alignment in this was really amazing for us. Each time you get into a room, having people meet who have never spoken before and are now starting to actually work together because of these. Um, these last two, I think, are things we can always do better. So at the end of the day, someone has to, has to foot the bill for this work. And that means in the current economic climate we work within, we need to be able to show the business case. We need to really be able to speak in numbers and emphasize what that means for the different units that have to commit their time, their effort, and their money and resources to this. So I think this is a super important one, and us as designers really need to be learning these skills much better. 
or if we can't do it ourselves, involving people that do know it, because we have plenty of people around us, you know, you're not an island working with people that can do this. Um, and then the last one there is, I think, the one that kind of covers the next steps for us is, is really, because this project was a bottom-up initiative, we need to be working both top-down and bottom-up. So th those, those things need to come hand-in-hand. Hand. You know, you can't, you can't run towards implementation without having an organizational strategy that is, that is going towards this. You can't, we can't be always winning with Trojan horses. You know, that sometimes does happen, but it's not enough anymore. We live in a world today where we really, as organizations, we need to be having this at the core of our, our strategies. So for us, what this really means, I guess, as I said before, to iterate on our own process, we need to explore different models to engage with, with large organizations. So as an agency ourselves, we need to be doing that. So we need to be exploring different ways to engage, whether it's through mentorship opportunities or whatever it is that, that we can do to actually change our models a little bit, because we can't get there doing the way with things we've, we've been doing the whole way. So. The next one for us is helping to get that business alignment on a higher level. So really helping to people to kind of start to rally behind this work and start to say, okay, strategically this is what we're heading towards, but this is what it will look like to implement. So starting to draw those, those, um, those two levels together and start to bridge that gap in the middle towards implementation. So that's me, a lot of information, but I'm sure you have questions we can talk about on the panel. Thanks, Sabina. Uh, those of you who are not running off, maybe you should get up for a second and then sit down again while we put up the chairs. But don't run off too long and get a coffee, but you can quickly do it if you want to. <laughs> but really quickly, and do come back.
So welcome back up here on stage, the three of you. Uh, I think we've heard uh, quite a lot of, you know, from very high level to implementation. I think what we were talking about before already when we talked and what I would like the discussion also to continue around is one of the very, very important po topics of collaboration. Collaboration is something that, as you mentioned, Magnus, as well, these things cannot be done by anyone alone. It can't be done by one person alone. You are in a role where it might happen that you sometimes feel pretty alone. I don't know. Does it ever feel like that? It happens all the time. <laughs> it happens all the time. And I think that's, that's key to... Um, uh, you mentioned that also the, to get them with the stakeholders on board. I think you s sometimes or very often underestimate that. I mean, you, you have your vision clear, this is where we're heading, and then you start working. <laughs> and then you think that everyone tags along, uh, that they are where you are. And I think that's where I sometimes kind of am too fast as well. And, and, and that's also why you need to be, you have need to have a long-term perspective, I think. You need to have the vision or the long-term idea anchored with people. And then the road towards that can, you know, differ and be altered over time because there is organizational changes. When you came in, for instance, with this project, we made a huge organizational change for, for us um, uh, in January, meaning that, you know, the decision makers changed and, you know, the steering models that changed and, you know, so that, and that's going to happen all the time. But then if you have a enough number of people involved from the start, then you can rely on that, you know, there you have friends all over the organization, so to say, even though that they, they might change chairs. Um, yeah. You touched on this as well, of course, because we came into Telia as uh, outsiders, of course, but also I think for us the collaboration was also, of course, uh, coming in as an outsider is also another way of coming in and trying to collaborate. And you talked a little bit about this, but are there any more thoughts you have on that, on how it is to come in as an outsider? What w who is it that we need to engage internally a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a there's a couple of things there for me. I think there there is an advantage in some ways to being an outsider in the organization because it sort of allows people to say, look, we have we've spent this money to get these people in, you know, let's let's actually do something with it, let's make use of it. So that there is that. I think the other thing for us that was really tough was, you know, in these large organizations and the organizational restructure, people are moving all the time. Um, so you might start off with, um, you know, a couple of people that are driving the project forward and then that has to change. So I think that's been one of the most difficult challenges for us is actually getting new stakeholders on board, new owners of the project on board at each point and that we've sort of remained the constant. And so it's now at a point of, well, how do you help, you know, the people that are now there to actually take this and fly without us, you know, or, or wi with us sort of at, a, at an arm's length to be able to help where needed, but actually have that project be owned internally. Yeah. And I think, Sandra, I'm actually going to, you said, you mentioned earlier, I was very intrigued by this, about the countries, I mean, countries trying to agree on something. Because in the end, it's not just about organizations and agencies and, you know, or even governmental institutions. It's actually about the countries that need to to agree. Um, do you have any more thoughts on that? I'm just, I was just very intrigued on what kind of things, for example, would be discussed in trying to get, I don't know, colors. And it, it was just a very interesting, uh, interesting thought you sparked. Yeah. Um, so. I'm not a designer myself, but I was also very impressed by this because I, I have experience from the United Nations from another perspective, and I know that every every word is you know discussed over months. And I think that if someone from the outside had not come into the United Nations and said, look, this is what's going to be uh, communicative and uh, obvious to everyone, they would never, like 2030 would have passed before they would have agreed on it. Um, so the goals, uh, or like gender equality, for example, uh, those parts were already agreed on, but the symbols, for example, were not. Um, so I know that these sketches started off um, uh, for to um, the no hunger goal, for example, was... Um, it started off as a fork and um, uh, and a knife, uh, and a lot of people was like, 
that's not what most people in the world use to eat, obviously. I think um, the life on land started off with a pine tree. That's not how woods look uh, in the majority of the world. So I think that also, like that was a big discussion and that needs to be in the heads of the designers, um, which is now it's. Is that, is that an answer? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add to that because I think that really brings up that interesting point of, of diversity and inclusion, you know, which Sonia you mentioned before. But, you know, with the more perspectives we can get, the more we're going to be able to see that. Otherwise, you will keep kind of designing in, in silos. Uh, another one, just on collaboration, is well, I was thinking what you were saying, Magnus, on collaborating within the industry and also, you know, having the, the suppliers and everyone that you need to collaborate with. Do you see, is there any industry that's doing this great or that's any, anywhere where this works really, really well? Any of you? Typically what I, I would spot a bit is that the industry that get a lot of attention for their work in terms of being sustainable and that also do a lot is, I mean, in the industries where the business model as such is a bit problematic. I mean, if you look at Max Burgers, for instance, here in Sweden that have kind of transform their business a bit from selling burgers to you know selling climate positive burgers so the more burgers you eat the better it is for the climate and who would have thought and and so so i mean and they've been very good at for instance um helping their customers to make sustainable choices by presenting you know the co2 emission for the different menus but that wasn't typically 10 years ago something that would i mean you would probably want to hide that oh we don't talk about the emissions here and then what they've done is also they've included their customers' travel back and to the restaurants into their kind of, you know, total footprint. And I think that is one of the ways when you, if you're good at including your customers, then things are going to happen. Look at the grocery stores like Ica, for instance, or Coop in Sweden. I mean, they are also good at this too. And I think Coop had one a couple of years back. They said, well, we understand you can't all buy all our biodynamic products. But if you're to choose the top five that have the most kind of impact, then these five would be the ones, bananas or milk, for instance. So I think that th these kind of, th they've been good at communicating, involving their customers, and also making the choices easy, so to say. Yeah. I don't know if that answers it. Yeah, can I add to that? Um, <laughs> the survey that we did with the sustainability reporting companies um, we saw that, what you said, that the companies who are under watch, they are big or they are publicly owned, for example, they are the best at doing sustainability work, uh, which I think is a great point for everyone sitting here, for example, that the, uh, the public opinion, customers' opinions, it actually matters now. I know this has been a topic of discussion for ages. Does it matter or not what we choose in stores? Does it matter what we personally do? Now it does, because 95% of them said that the outside pressure from customers and public opinion, that drives change for companies. So I think that is a, that is a good point. I don't think Max would have done it had they not felt that they would gain, uh, you know, business advantages off it. Yeah, I mean, the example that comes to mind for me is um, as the Australian construction industry. So, um, you know, for years they had been competing with each other, of course, um, but now they're at a point where they don't compete any longer. You know, obviously they're still, they still want to be economically relevant, but they're actually getting together on forums and driving each other forward in terms of getting to a more sustainable place. And, and I think the as someone that's actually been in, in, inside those organizations as an external consultant as well, you know, it's really clear that they have these these goals. You know, they it's really clear that they collaborate in these ways across the industry. And I think at that level, you know, there's obviously the consumer to business level, but there's also business to business. So how are we actually pushing each others, each other as, as businesses um, to, to do better and to be better? Um, and I think that that Australian example, to be fair to them, you know, they are dealing with resources that are quite obvious, you know, so they know that the, the resources that they could, they're taking out of the ground to build these things, they're becoming scarce. So it's quite an obvious thing. And I think it is harder for companies like Telia where you know, you're sort of in the middle so that, you know, the, the connection to where those resources are coming from is a little bit further back. Um, but the more we can help draw that connection for people, the, the easier it'll be. 
I was also, now that you said Max, I was actually thinking one thing that you had the staircase of, or the steps of how far inside an organization is actually, or how far they are in their sustainability effort. I think we've before worked, for example, with a, with a pyramid where you have on a campaign level integrated in your products and services and then integrated in your organization, which is kind of the highest you can be. And I, w I actually immediately, I always think when, some, when I hear something like Max, now I haven't looked at that in detail, but there are a lot of companies that are staying on this campaign level. They're using it because they feel they do what they have to do, but then they do whatever they think looks good. And I, mean, I really love the term that you had, um, Sandra, when we talked about this earlier, of goal washing. You know, it's not just about green washing anymore. That happens on a lot more levels, just the goal washing. We know what the goals are, so let's try and stick them on there somewhere. So I think, how do you go, how do you help? Because of course, I think there's also examples like H&M uh, recently, you know, you do something, you also get a lot of bad press about whatever you do. It's never enough, it's never, you know, never the right thing or whatever. So I think it's of course good if people start on the campaign level, but how do you get, how do you get to that number six or seven? I think the only way is to, to, to under, uh, I think ma what Max did, I would say there's probably not the campaign there because what they've actually done is that they've certified the, this whole process with climate positivity as one of the first companies in the world. So that's kind of, they're looked upon. But that what they do typically is that they climate compensate, right? There's, there's no such thing as in Hamburg that has no um, climate effect, so to say. So you need to, to do something about that by, by compensating in other projects, like uh, investing in solar or wind, for instance. But, but I think it's also, I think it's a good example when you say that you should also be collaborating within industries. Um, the telecom industry where I am, we've done that in different aspects. For instance, when it comes to protecting children online um, and, and ma making sure that we can do what we can to detect um, uh, material online that has that shows um, material where, where kids are being abused um, and that's one of the very very few examples where we actively would co cooperate with others and with the police and others and, all, and also actively kind of stop information from in uploading in our networks otherwise we wouldn't do that so these are topics that are super sensitive for us we don't do that randomly and it's not like we're stopping internet sites just because we don't you know share the political vision or, or something with them but there are some certain rare topics where we actually would cooperate and then let's go all in for those then rather than to do something all over the place. And I think that's what Max have done as well. They've gone all in on their kind of most material thing, which is that people are increasingly worried about fast food effects on their health and on the climate, and, and, and they're helping their customers on the way. Um, but it needs to be integrated. If it's just a tag on and saying, well, you know, now you can eat hamburgers, it's better than before, because, you know, then, then it wouldn't help. It needs to be integrated, yeah. Yes, definitely, and Max was punished for <coughs> for this campaign that they said they were saving the world uh, one bite at the time. They are not, obviously, uh, but yet we are talking about them and they are setting an example for their industry and food is a very complex problem because we, we, need, we need to eat. That's not uh, something we can stop consuming. Uh, we might not need to eat hamburgers, but we, we, might, we have to eat something, right? Um, and that field is also very complex uh, because some people still argue that we are saving like uh, Swedish biotop by eating meat. Some say we have to go vegan uh, to grow trees there that we can burn and um, store that carbon from. Um, but still, I think it has to be it has to be at a campaign level as well. It has to be part of your core business. It has to be uh, an awareness of all your employees and you have to also get it out in public to your customers. Um, and if you're punished for that, so be it. I mean, it's gonna be um, a sort of chaotic time because we don't have frameworks for this yet. We don't have a way that we're used to receiving this information. Um, we all have different opinions on what to eat, for example, what to consume. Uh, but I think I think they are setting an important example by being out there. 
is, is it better to go to a, com a competitor of, uh, of theirs? Uh, I don't think so. Um, so communication is still super, super important here. Um, because you cannot just do sustainability and not talk about it. Your customers won't know it. It won't change public opinion. Uh, it won't drive um, a change in behavior and so on and so on. Yeah, I think for, for me, like the H&M example really, really hits home for me. Um, earlier this week, I was, I was kind of looking on social media about, you know, their, their new sort of sustainability and eco-conscious range that they've released globally now. Um, and there are a lot of critics out there, of course, as part of the fashion revolution. There's, you know, there's a lot of critics saying, yeah, but it's not part of your core business. So how can you be claiming to be this? You know, I think... At this point, we're no longer at a point where we can criticize that. We have to say, look, we need to get this in the mainstream. The mainstream needs to, the people that already purchase at H&M that are constantly buying there without having any thought whatsoever about the climate, once they see H&M doing it, they will start to think differently. If they are buying that, H&M is going to see that as part of their core business, and those are the things that are going to move that giant towards a better future. We're not going to be able to get rid of H&Ms like this. You know, fast fashion isn't going to die overnight, so we need to actually move that giant bit by bit, and I think the key to doing it is, you know, part of it is the campaigns, obviously, but it's really helping to kind of um, put that into the mainstream um, and help people start to change their behaviours on a day-to-day -day and, and challenge not just the people that are kind of early adopters, but everybody else as well. We had a question over there. Wait, I'm just going to come with the microphone. I was actually just going to open up for questions. So <laughs> let's do that now. Let's, uh, let's ask questions. Yeah, I was just thinking of this, the codependency with the customers. Um, and for example, IKEA will be launching a co-creational process to create new products together with their customers. And I was thinking, how will you continue your work with your customers since this has been included in this process, but how will that be you know, used going forward? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, with this specific project, we just discussed this over a coffee that, you know, it needs to continue because we, we can't do something one off and then we're finished and then everyone's going to be happy forever. So it's a continuous process. So when we look at the innovation projects also that I kind of highlighted a bit, it's, it's about learning all the time and it's about understanding more and it's constantly changing. So I think we, we need to be good at, I mean, on a high level, we need to be good at kind of um, interacting. We need to be good at understanding who are our main stakeholders, who, what customers or other partners or even competitors should we kind of join forces with and then develop together with them. And also with our customers sitting down, as I showed with the Solnas city here, kind of, you know, continue that discussion. So we are doing follow-ups follow with them now, for instance. Um, and I think it's also one thing there is just to tag on to that and to the other is that you know, you always need to balance short and long term. That sustainability needs to be, I mean, it must not be profitable short term perhaps, but it must be a long term mindset. And so you must do perhaps some sacrifice short term to actually, so it can cost and it can be a bit, you know, s strange, but you need to work with your competitors sometimes, but perhaps you need to do that to, to move forward. So we will most definitely continue doing that, yes, working with our customers. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good question too. We have, in I mean, we have divisions that work with kind of new te technologies and innovation, and 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 then the the uh, I would say the uh, challenge perhaps is to make sure that innovation also hits you know the, the pr products and services that are, are not as innovative, so to say, that are kind of the the br butter and bread products and services. Um, so innovation is very much embedded in parts of the company, but perhaps not in you know in ex exactly everywhere. And I think that's a typically for a large organization where you disrupt yourself from within sometimes. So what you innovate here kind of um, lowers the revenues of that product over time. And you need to dare to do that. Yeah. We have two questions. One, I'm going to take, I'm going to try and keep that for them. So we'll take one question there in the back. Can you just pass one? Uh, great presentations. Uh, uh, very interesting and well done. Uh, I was just wondering how well, uh, how representative actually is Telia Company. I, I started to speak to you with the, about that minus because you have a certain uh, owner structure where the government actually owns 40%. And I was actually at the another event two days ago about uh, finances driving sustainability. And 
there was a great divide between the scientific community and the investors. So a lot of the investors, they actually understand and they, and they want to, to do this, but the risk models are very short-sighted, as, as you touched upon now. So um, what, what are your take on that? And how, how do you believe the more like cold cash, uh, like BlackRock, for example, they, they were brought up like, like an investor, which they have like eight trillions of investments are the biggest group in the world and they seem to be not very interested in this at the moment so how could you get those kind of investors on the train so you mentioned black i mean i think that's one of the key things we <coughs> we actually we need to train the investors as well or educate them or talk to them like we do with the suppliers and with the customers so we are going to our customers now and saying listen you need to put higher demands on us because otherwise, because we're investing heavily in 5G technology, let's give me that as an example. That's something that an investor would be super interested in. If we invest one billion Swedish kroner in, in 5G technology for the next generation networks, then we need to get be able to, to have a price premium to sell our services already today, perhaps. Because our customers kind of must be part of investing in our future and their future. And, and that's what I would think that if we discuss with our investors also, they need to understand that when we do these big time investments, we need to be long term, it, we can't be short term. So that's for one. But then when we talk to the investors and we do that regularly and our um, management does that regularly, then typically we need to train them also. They ask us, well, how can we validate you then? What KPIs should we look at? And so we need to perhaps sometimes also co-create KPIs so to say that they actually can ask for and validate upon. And so I, I think there's always going to be the balance between short and long term. We see that in every business case, in every investment decision or in every project, it's we can use these, I mean, an, uh, environmental KPIs or the, the goals that we have to, to as a backdrop, but they still need to be profitable. Um, and so we need to show the investors and discuss with the investors that you know we are a good investment over time because we are preparing for an unknown future. And and what better kind of framework around that is it than the agenda 2030 then because i mean to be honest we need to invest in in being in disrupting ourselves and others and the investors need to see that um but obviously it's it's always you know the short sighted short term quarterly revenues they're they're going to be there as well so we need to be able to have two thoughts in our heads at the same time i think yeah yeah, thank you, because I think it's a very relevant question. The financial industry is lagging uh, when it comes to sustainability, and they, as you said, come from a very risk um, perspective, uh, and I think that's where the change also needs to happen. They are afraid, obviously, of sitting on dead assets, and when the public opinion shifts, when companies shift, uh, a lot of companies are going to end up there uh, and not have capital you know, being um, being attractive uh, for them. So I think we are seeing a great change in the financial industry, but it's moving far too slow, uh, and it's s it's the small players um, that are driving that change. Summa Equity in Stockholm, for example, who are mapping all of their um, investments to the sustainability goals. Um, but I know that BlackRock is shifting right now um, also. Um, I think the pension funds are driving this change also. Um, it, is, uh, it is a relevant question because that is where when change are really gonna happen uh, when it affects capital. I mean, the, the only thing I would add here is I think the customer perspective is really important. So, I you know, I always bring the example of, you know, as Australia's banks at the moment. You know, they have massive departments that are about customer centricity and really working with customers. So I think for the financial sector, that is a space that you can actually really start with because that's where that's where the money's coming in and that's where the sort of money's going. And so if you can start to actually push that forward, then hopefully the sustainability um, agenda can actually follow that as well. <laughs> okay, I'm really conscious of time. I'm actually gonna take one last question. You had the one and then I think Everybody can just continue discussing out there over another coffee. Um, but I'm just conscious that there's going to be people that want to leave. 
Thank you. Uh, yesterday I attended another seminar where McKinsey and Company, together with Verde, presented the business value of design, something we in the design scene have discussed for 30 years. What, on the bottom line, where does design, what's the impact? So the same thing here. What's the business value of resilient, sustainable thinking? And what was a turning point for you in time and argument to, bo to launch these bold goals? On the go, on the goals. Um, yeah, but I think it. it um, I mean, we've been working with sustainability and an environment for environmental goals. We've had these ISO fourteen thousand one certification for fifteen years, and so, so this is nothing new, really. We've been working with children's rights and privacy matters and anti-corruption and diversity. I mean, all these things that you would uh, kind of pack into a sustainability kind of under an umbrella we've been working with, but but what we perhaps were lacking was kind of the simple communicative and, and, and powerful messaging across the whole organization on where we, where what standpoint we take on climate and environment. Um, and so that kind of grew as we went along and last year was kind of a year where we, we just realized that we need to be much, much more firm on this. First, because if we are, then we can easier talk to our customers why it is important for them to disrupt their business because as we saw here digitalization is you know key to other businesses change so then we need to tell everyone that we want to be at center of that kind of change and by doing by doing our homework and putting our kind of targets up there we kind of can inspire others so it's part of is a business strategy thing it's a thing that uh, uh, talks to the investors because they then, I mean, we presented those at the, uh, at the investors meet um, when we presented our annual report. And then comes the questions on hmm, how is this, this being measured and can you report back to us the next time, next quarter? And exactly that is now happening. So we're putting up work streams where we are starting to pr pr you know, give measures to the investors. And even though you know, we are the only ones doing that, then that will start thinking in their heads we believe that you know they will start asking others for the same type of kpis and then we might form a standard here so it's about also moving moving first but um and there is always a risk of green gold washing and green washing and being accused for that so we need to all the time have proof points that we have aligned this in in our business everyone is on board so to say and we can show progress uh quarter by quarter i mean that's the only w only thing i think we need to do or the most important yeah Yeah, your coffee, that's true. Anyway, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Sabina, Sandra, and Magnus for today. Thanks all of you for coming. It was really good to have you here. And if you would like to continue the discussion, we're still here, of course. We're not going, we, we work here, we're not going anywhere. Um, but also, uh, you, you're welcome to follow us for on LinkedIn or on Facebook um, for other events. There are gonna be more of those um, because it's just nice to sit here in the morning. Thank you very much. Thanks.